is Joshua, and I'm one of the organizers of Bang Bang Con West 2019. We're so glad you're watching. I wanted to give you a brief heads up before you watch the recording of Vijay Um Amel's amazing keynote that in her discussion at the Arab Spring, the video contains some graphic images of police violence. I hope you find her story of discovering Glitch as a form of resistance as powerful and exciting as I do. Enjoy. Hi, day two, good morning. Um, I'm really excited to be here, and I love think I, I really love this uh, conference model, and I want to thank the organizers who've been really tremendous, and the community that has generated around this. Before I start, I'm just going to introduce, reintroduce myself in terms of a data body and a real body. That's why I sort of confuse people with all these different names. So I'm just going to throw out this idea about what a data body is and what a real body is. Uh, it's, these are not necessarily, uh, anyhow. So this is, an, <laughs> this is an idea that I learned from Ricardo Dominguez, who's a, a professor at UC San, San Diego. And he said, you know, the data body is your GPA. It's your social security number, it's your FICA score, or credit score that allows you to get a house or not. It's your, um, I don't know, your bank history, your immigration papers. Uh, your real body, well here is mine, it started out like about this big and it's gone through all, all kinds of <laughs> contours and it can, who knows how it's going to continue changing, right? And in fact, I can do all kinds of transformations with this real body. So um, that's why I present uh, my name as uh, Leila Shirin Sa'ar, that's, the name, that's my name, I go by and uh, Vijay Um Amal is the moniker that I've created in a creative in a performative um, art practice over the last 10 years. And so feel free to tweet away, hashtag away, um, et cetera. So, so with that in mind, uh, a little bit about my background. I do data-driven knowledge production. And so I just want to show like where I'm coming from. So I've done um, video production and web design, graphic design for like 20 years. It started out when uh, not doing traditional filmmaking. Um, it was rather uh, activist work as uh, live VJing and performing um, projection mapping in streets, uh, outdoor and, and public places. Um, and so I actually started building in quartz and used Max, uh, MS, uh, Max uh, MSP jitter. Who knows what that is? Yay! I'm in, my, I'm in the right crowd. And uh, yeah, we started using processing and action script, which used to be the language to um, build interactive platforms in Flash. And then meanwhile, I was building websites, and we did our first, you know, uh, first websites were built in MySQL using WordPress or Drupal. And then over time, um, that WordPress, and I'll tell you the stories, but the servers kept breaking, so I went and I created an application stack, and now I'm uh, doing my web, um, archival and analysis work on something called Eucalyptus, which is like a, a, a mechanical Turk. And to be honest, uh, I can't do this. This is now beyond my level of proficiency, so I'm in need of collaboration at all times. Uh, I've gone on to you know, move through this different visual lens, um, doing, using VDMX and Unity and gaming uh, for gaming and net data visualization. Um, and now I'm experimenting with some VR technologies. So I want to sort of position what I do. Uh, I, I'm a professor at UCSB now, um, and so I think a lot about things. <laughs> I make and think. Uh, my job is uh, uh, media uh, theory and practice uh, uh, assistant professor, which means to think about how to not just theorize, but to make and theorize at the same time. Traditionally, um, Sciences and humanities are the way we, we've figured out how to learn <laughs> and forever. Um, in 1982, uh, there was this uh, study done in the UK by the Royal College of Art on the design and general education for uh, the United Kingdom. And there was a whole bunch of things that came out of it, a lot of reports and a lot of publications. One that was most notable is Nigel, Cross, Nigel, Nigel Cross's Designerly Ways of Knowing, um, in which he said, all right, we've always had the sciences and the humanities. We need to add design to our curriculum. 
into the way of ways of knowing. And um, what came out of the study was sort of a definition of design as a concep conception of realization of new things, as a synthesis of form and content, and really a, a way to solve a process for solving problems. And while uh, in the humanities, literacy is the tool that you need to master, and in the sciences, numeracy is the tool that you need to have aptitude in, in design, the language is of modeling. And it is learnable and teachable. And so what they, the sum of Nigel Cross's researches could be put into this sort of really just little data visualization. And he makes the distinction that the phenomenon of study in the sciences is the natural world, humanities is the human experience. But in design, it's the artificial world. While in the sciences, we use controlled experiment and classification and analysis, in the arts and humanities, we use an analogy and metaphor evaluate to, and to evaluate. But in design, we do pattern formation and synthesis. But the primary value for that is ingenuity and empathy, practicality, and, and, a, and designing something appropriate for a particular set of circumstances or people, um, while in the primary value in the arts and humanities is a commitment to justice and in science, truth or accuracy. So this design thinking uh, has grown and it has um, who has heard about the uh, iterative design model? Okay, it sort of has come from this mode of thinking and this school of thought uh, that the design thinking process starts out with empathy and then you go to divine, uh, defi defining the problem and then you ideate and you go back and you reiterate that and eventually you prototype and test. Well, this way, this iterative design model has really been used in the business schools, mostly, right? Um, and in fact, this, what we understand to be the design process is often uh, told through the lens of uh, corporatizing and monetizing the products. And so there's this added part to design thinking, which is actually piloting and creating a business model around the thing that you created. And how do you think that might affect your first questions and your observations? and the problems you're trying to solve if at the very end you're trying to fit it into a business model. And what if you are a networks of young and revolutionaries across Egypt, Brazil, the United States, anywhere, everywhere, designing culture with social media? This is where my story starts. In, um, And today, as of today, there remains 22 days before Ala Abdel Fattah is released from his five-year sentence in Cairo's Torah prison after protest, uh, for protesting after the Egyptian government passed a law criminalizing demonstrations. Ala has been in Cairo's Torah prison since 2014. And here, this was printed in 2017. He wrote to the rights con who keep um, every year since they've been having something in his, in, in memory, in his honor. And I don't know if they invited him or he's in prison, right? So he writes to the rights con from prison last year or two years ago. He says, this week I start my fourth year in prison. I might be released in October if my appeal is accepted, but then I might not. I might be released in March 2019 when I serve my full sentence. He goes on, I might, I might not. But that's not really what worries me. We live in hugely reactionary times. My defeat was inevitable. What worries me is that by the time I manage to make it to this conference or another like it, I will simply be a total embarrassment to the organizers and attendees. You see, in my isolation, I can only build a fragmented picture of what the world outside looks like. And when it comes to tech, that picture is solely based on what filters through state-controlled media of the views and actions and governments of governments and giant tech companies, not what people and community, communities are doing and saying. Now, you would not enjoy watching a Luddite ramble on about a terrifying dystopia in which labor rights are trampled up by startups that don't even plan to make a profit or pay taxes, 
but are somehow able to raise enough capital to flood markets, overwhelm, overwhelm regulators, influence policy, litigate perpetually, and still have enough left to spend on PR that spins the whole, uh, all this as the glorious disruptive effect of the gig economy. A dystopia in which free debate and a shared public sphere rooted in commonly experienced, very decent, decentralized reality is replaced with a news feed selected by an obscure algorithm based on one's circle of friends and choice of celebrities. On, 20, on the 20th of March 2004, Ala Abdel Fattah and Manal Bahi Eddin Hassan, his, uh, his partner, first went live with their blog Manal and Ala's Bitbucket in Cairo. They were exploring and experimenting with web, publishing platform, uh, with web publishing platforms that would facilitate the web presence of other groups and small initiatives um, in Arabic. Ala and Manal's Bitbucket was one of the earliest blogs to come out of Egypt and the Arab world. Its content was born of the public event. The 20th of March 2004 was the first anniversary of the massive global protests against the war on Iraq. The war on Iraq is the starting point in this uncanny historical recountenance, not 9-11. At the time, I was a fellow open source designer building Arabic and English websites for academic and activist communities in Washington, DC. I met uh, Alaa and Manal in 2007 uh, through the Arab network of uh, designers and programmers on Drupal while building the beta version of the Archive software system right here at UC Santa Cruz when I was doing my MFA in digital arts and new media. Shout out to Danum. Um, yeah. So, you know, so he basically, we met on Drupal. Uh, he was leading, this is on that bio page, he was leading um, the Arabic language team of programmers. We were building wi uh, WYSIWYGs from right to left. We're doing a lot of right to left, a character, uh, uh, UTF-8, Arabic language, um, character uh, typo typographical things. This was like 10 years ago, 20, 12 years ago. Um, he's been on here for 14 years. Let's just read his bio. From his work with children, he wrote this, from his work with children using Facebook to ridicule their teachers in the Arab digital expression camps, to his work with pro-democracy activists using blogs to mobilize thousands of Egyptians against the governments in, in the Kafaya movement, Alaa just loves helping people use the ICTs, stick it to the man. Okay, I, you know, I have so much admiration. Uh, he's been in uh, Torres prison, as I said, for, for, for serving his five-year sentence and it's coming up to two in 22 days, he should be released. And there he is. Um, and you can see, yeah, get a sense of how big this, tr this um, network has been. Um, okay. This informal network of Arab techies developed over the years as we forged new relationships and initiatives. And this included uh, the Jordanian blog Hiber, the Nesawiya feminist collective in Lebanon that is no longer up, but there's some glitch there. You see <laughs> the name is left somehow. Um, my own Twitter archiving project using Archif. And at the time, you know, we were getting together to, to build all of these tools in Arabic, in open source, to, to promote a free flow of information on the internet. Because at, when the internet boomed in the Middle East, governments started doing what they always did with, sta with, state con with media, which is try to control it at the state level. So you would go to certain websites and it'd use 404. And they'd have these really, in Qatar, every country was different. They had these cute little cartoons. Oh, don't, oh, ugh, this is not anything we want to see in our country. Oh, sorry, oops, I can't, you know, very cute. Well, it wasn't so cute in Tunisia, um, where they actually, that's where they started um, uh, really resisting the, uh, the censorship of the internet. 
And Amar 404 became an expression, a digital campaign that was used um, in, in Tunisia by their netizens, to use an old word. Um, and it refers to the internet uh, and um, to refer to the internet and the surveillance apparatus that was used under the former ruler uh, uh, Ben Ali. Uh, Ammar is just a first name for a male and 404 is derived from page not found. And here you see it was a very big uh, movement in 2010. Um, they, uh, the Flickr was um, censored, YouTube was censored, Pe they were making memes and jokes. Uh, Twitter was still active, but the minute Facebook went down, all hell broke loose. Um, and so we had this, this huge uh, campaign. And this is in May 2010. Um, here's a group of Arab women techies. I'm, I, you can see me in the middle with glasses and thinking I'm cool or something. And it says, Ammar Sayyib Salah. And this is part of, this is the Arabic, um, Ammar's not found, you know, page not found. Um, and here we were after our own meeting thinking this is cute and light and having no sense of the direction that this, uh, the politics of the time were moving. Authoritarianism, poverty, social and economic injustice, and state brutality fueled the Arab uprisings, which we conventionally think of as beginning in 2010 when the Tunisian street vendor Mohamed Bouazizi set himself on fire to protest the police's arbitrary seizure of his vegetable stand. It was in Tunisia that the call for the, the, the people demand the fall of the re regime first enveloped streets and imaginations. It would not be long before the contagion of hope would spread to, out to Egypt. Earlier that year, in the summer of 2010, the Egyptian police brutally beat an Alexandrian blogger, Khalid Said, to death. His brother photographed his mangled face at the morgue, and Khalid would inspire a page titled, We Are All Khalid Said, and his brutalized image would become the face of revolution. So in my talk today, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm really introducing this idea of glitch as an error or failure to, and, and to show you how it serves as a point of entry for activists and artists to resist the system design by drawing on my current book project called Glitch Resistance, the Arab Uprising, Social Media, and the Virtual Body Politic. So glitch originated as a mechanical term for a sudden interruption noise error or malfunction. It is a part of a different kind of language, a technical semiotics. Sorry for getting all highbrow here, but it, follow, follow along, please. It expands the logic and language of algorithms in a networked social landscape by introducing the messiness and mistakes that render the technological infrastructure more visible. A handful of artists and scholarly works have already begun to introduce this idea of glitch into the lexicon in, in, in the field, uh, like Rosa Meckman, uh, uh, Asendorf, uh, Peter Krapp, Mark Nunes. Yet while the glitch has been closely associated with technology, it can also illuminate several areas of human experience and understanding. It is both, both a thing that disrupts the flow or movement designed within a system and an errant action. For example, a glitch in computer software is a set of code that causes the software to mal malfunction. One can si also say that hackers have glitched banking systems by making account information visible. Glitches are a lens for understanding the operational uh, logic uh, of the systems of power. Uh, here is an example of how uh, I want to show you the, how my process of um, trying to archive and the internet in Arabic and work with the Arabic open source movement through the Arab uprisings. And my work through it was a series of glitches and failures. It began, this is the Archief uh, dashboard that I had built uh, uh, originally in 2010. And this is what was operating, um, this is the data visualizations that were operating when I was pulling in Twitter by hashtag and archiving it. I didn't have the, I was on a shared server, and the, when the revolution started, uh, exploded, went to a VPN or VPN server, it says VPS, I don't know, 
And then I went to a direct server, and eventually I went on to a cloud computing sys uh, instance, and I was able to sustain the uh, programming at that level. Um, and here, you see um, another sort of glitch. The last time I was in Tahrir, the last meeting I had with the Arab techies was July in 2011. And this is when, um, I mean, the revolution started in January. So by July, by the end of the year, by the end, we, the, the military um, and the Muslim Brotherhood gained power over the revolutionary and the radical left. And so you started seeing that shift. Um, and so, so not only were there technological glitches, but there were these political glitches. You, because of technology that we are able now to look at and understand. So I was in the Tahrir Square where we were at a meeting and we all decided let's go to Tahrir because there's a demonstration. And um, I'm like, okay, sounds like a great idea. And you'll see it was a really hot day. And the water, and so I was just, we, were, we had met, we thought we were going to continue um, developing uh, servers and across the Arab world, thinking about Syria in particular. Here we are, now we're in Tahrir Square, and you see that all of a sudden they break out into uh, singing the national anthem. And I was with those friends, so I think I gave my, I gave my camera to a friend because I wanted, I got all caught up in this national fervor, excuse me. I needed to buy a, a flag. So I'm buying a flag, I turn around, I, like, I don't even know how much time I was, I was buying a flag. And by the time I turned around, um, the whole scene had changed. And these guys were the, revolution, the revolutionary uh, folks had left Tahrir and the Muslim Brotherhood had entered the space to, and it was time to pray. And in Islam, it, it's, yeah, it's really like night and day. And then, I turned around. Okay. And it was time to pray, and the Muslim Brotherhood was there. So it was like literally <laughs> over, like I was <laughs> buying a flag, and I turned around, and all of a sudden I'm among these people. And if you know in Islam, typically the men, uh, you know, men and women are to uh, pray separately. So here I am, a Muslim woman with my hair uncovered, and I just. You know, of love. I just joined in, um, but it was a pretty striking moment. So that was my last time in Tahrir. There we go. And after that period. Okay. After that period, we went to. Um, I came back to the States um, and I ended up uh, using a lot of my footage. Things had changed this by October 2011, or this is, uh, this is 2013. There had been a coup and the revolutionaries actually were most of them in prison or had uh, disappeared. And then the, by 2013, there was a military coup and Abdel Fattah Sisi has taken over uh, in a very authoritarian uh, uh, election, and he's now the president of the, of the country. So here is um, a live VJ performances that I started doing after, uh, had, after having been in Tahrir, I started producing these glitch um, aesthetics. And I want to show you a couple pieces of it. In, 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 in talk about.
footage taken from balconies of people on the streets uh, being dragged around by their hair. A lot of footage of, there was the, blue, the girl in the blue bra incident where such her, some girl was, her clothes were ripped off and she had a blue bra on underneath. And so that became uh, how she was known. And, um, here's the blue bras. And there's a guy who jumped up and, um, in a nationalist fervor, got the Egyptian flag and went up to the Israeli embassy. And I don't know, sorry you know, doing this. Um, okay. Okay, I'm gonna just stop here. This is a 15 minute live performance that I did at the Hemispheric uh, uh, Performance in, uh, Conference in 2013. Um, here's another really interesting moment of uh, failure. Um, these are real political glitches, right? Uh, I, I'm, not, uh, I'm leading up to the artistic of glitches. <laughs> but um, so I had all this data that I was aggregating and collecting, and I was a graduate student, and I was, a I was asked to do a sentiment analysis. Does anybody know what a sentiment analysis is? Okay, I don't have to go into it, but sentiment analysis on 140 or 140 characters is almost impossible, and you can think of why. So they, I, they made me do it on the pr potential presidential, potential presidential um, candidates in Egypt um, in 2012, and the red means a negative uh, sentiment, the uh, green is a positive sentiment, the size of the bubble reflects how much uh, how many tweets were tweeted about these uh, individuals. Um, and I went to Cairo to show this, the, <laughs> the results, and everyone started laughing when, I sh when I, the slide came up, and I didn't understand why. Well, Mur Murtada Marsur came out as completely positive. He was the, the laughing stock of Cairo at the time, and my Twitter analysis, my analysis couldn't pick up sarcasm, <laughs> right? You know when you say, yes, when you say, uh, that's so bad, and you mean it's so good, and all kinds of different cultural uh, innuendos that because of the emotional register of social media, and particularly Twitter, there's something unique about that media platform. It enables you to have, to make that, uh, to, to have an emotion, to, to speak emotionally. I mean, look at our current president, right? There's, it's, it's, it's acceptable to speak with at a certain um, with a certain nuance in uh, on social media. So within this theoretical framework, so excusing the theory, but I think it's important. The release of videos taken at the massacre. I'm going to pick one massacre, which is in Maspero in Cairo, 2011. Um, for example, this can be understood as glitch resistance. So what happened is that Maspero massacre initially started as demonstrations on, Oct on October 2011 by a group dominated by Egyptian Coptic Christians. In reaction to the demolition of a church in Upper Egypt, claimed to be built without appropriate license. The peaceful uh, protesters who intended to stage a sit-in in front of the Maspero television building were attacked by security forces and the army, resulting uh, in many deaths and injuries. And, so the, the video footage taken by acti activists and journalists on the ground shows the army running over protesters in military vehicles, in some cases mounting pavements outside the state media building, and then uploading and streaming them across uh, YouTube and different social media platforms, and interrupting, glitching the state's media infrastructure and flow of information. Because you know, even though these, these gruesome videos went were viral for a certain population. Nevertheless, the Egyptian government seemed to be completely unaware that these videos were even out there. In a, in a televised press conference, the Egyptian authorities claimed that the military was not to blame, instead that the army personnel were unarmed and conversely were attacked by the protesters, despite that the video shows otherwise. You know, here's just a little clip. 
We found an APC running towards us really fast. In the beginning, it was like just one. So we thought it was a stupid soldier driving it. And then we found another one joining it, and they were both going in zigzags, hitting people, running them over, and going back and forth. They were unarmed. The army was attacked by the protesters. You know the story, right? And this video is going viral. These videos, not this video, there are many of them, are going viral on uh, YouTube. one point we hid okay. behind the kind of so that's on ramp to the bridge really an important reading there were a bunch of media collectives one is called Moisserin they have an archive of a lot of this footage and they've been able to archive it outside of Egypt there's another great media collective called Kazibun is the arabic word for the liars and it's very interesting because we have a very similar experience here in the United States about tr fake news and real news and this is fake and that's true and you know President Sisi has many times said that there's been recently last month on 60 Minutes claimed that there has been that there's no um, violence or there's, there's been no uh, detention there are no political prisoners in Egypt which is kind of ironic um, The confluence of accumulating injustice and the political possibility catalyzed the uprisings from Cairo to Libya, Syria, Yemen, Bahrain, and regimes fell and new ones emerged. And it was not long before the, the forces of counter-revolution would take hold, begin bringing in civil war, reconsolidation, recon reconsolidation of authoritarianism, military recalcitrance, and the imprisonment of activists and bloggers. Um, I, I don't really know, was all of this a glitch or is the present moment a glitch? Um, I've really popular, you know, uh, this idea of trying to understand how, what happened in Tahrir Square and what does this resistance look like online is something that I'm left with. And the works, I'm going to show you this last bit, uh, I'm going to show you the progression of my uh, data visualizations from the same data set. Um, and you'll see that, the, that I progressively um, ask questions around glitch. And if they, it does a violence to the surface of the image, it also might enable us to see more by questioning the source, revealing the, the material support of the digital ether, and suggesting how images are recomposed in circulation. So here you see, um, uh, this is a network graph. I used Gephi. It's very abstract, but right? What you see here is a big, hairy, maybe you like the look. I don't know. The green, what this represents is 60,000 people or users who tweeted half a million tweets on using the hashtag Syria over a one period, over one month in the summer of July 2011 before the, 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 war, the international war on Syria, okay? And what I was trying to do is see how much Arabic, and I was trying to do a language um, distinction. So the green is the Arabic tweets, and the, uh, the blue are the English language tweets, and the red ones are French. So I was like, okay, this is pretty, but what the hell, and how do I make meaning? This is, a, this is sort of what Glitch does, really abstract aesthetics. So I, then I'm like, okay, because you know I'm all concerned about the real bodies and the data bodies, and so I try to make it into a game. I'm not a game designer. I totally have lots of respect for game designers, but here's my attempt of making it into a game, in Unity, where it's this immersive space, and I don't make any physics. I go through the trees and stuff, but it, there's, it's like a game of tweets. Um, and then I'm going to show you where I'm at now. So let me just show you um, what this was like this gamification of the 2D Gephi map. As you can see, I'm actually using the same data set. It's taking the 2D 
data visualization and making it into 3D, which is not really glitch technique. And I want to, I'm going to end on that. I don't know what to do. I'm not going to talk. reflects the quantity of trees, the, the distance between the actual, sorry, I'll wait till I'm done. I'll go through the trees. You know what I'm talking about, those who design communities. Okay, so, you know, what I did was I translated the, uh, the nodes were the mountaintops, and the distance between the mountaintops were the, were the edges. Um, and that the edges, the nodes represent the actual users, the edges represent the tweets. This is sort of how data visualization traditionally is done when we do network visualization. Um, but I was trying to give us a sense of being inside it, inside and immersed within this network sphere as opposed to at being this abstracted, very far uh, perspective. So, you know, I, I, had, I, I have taken our chief offline for all kinds of political reasons. Um, I want to show you another method of what I'm calling glitch resistance. This is a mosaic motif of using large quantities of uh, tweets and the videos that were of this tweets. city about the, um, the Freddie Gray incident. Okay, I can't talk and chew gum at the same time. And to the youth of this city, I will seek justice on your behalf. This is a moment, this is your moment. You're at the forefront of this cause. And as young people, our time is now. There's so many of these stories and these incidences in this country, in other countries, and they are documented online, and they, we forget them afterwards. And so I think one uh, method of glitch resistance is simply to, aha, <laughs> to uh, think about reassembling these in new ways. So what you have here is um, the same methodology I used in building it in 2D, not videos is a, a system of, um, it's a mosaic process um, using Mazika, which is a software, open source software system. And what I did was I had collected all of the people who had tweeted about um, this particular uh, protest, and then I pulled images, either the images that they were tweeting, or in this case, this is, these are their profile images because it's easier, which I don't like to do because I'm not trying to identify the users. I, rat, I very much am trying not to do that. And that's been kind of part of the problem of how do you do analysis and how do you provide new insight into social media and how do you support the activists today without, without in, in the age of deep surveillance and um, privacy issues. So I'm, I don't have an answer for that. But anyhow, but I moved on to the, the, the video rendering. You take one image that's iconic, and then you make it up, remake it with a bunch of different images. And this is uh, where I am now. <coughs> because the glitch technique is so abstract, I've done a series of uh, new, uh, the glitch resistance um, using processing and doing pixel sorting. Anybody, people know what pixel sorting is? And these are, these are uh, techniques that have been developed over the last 10 years, starting processing two. We're now in five, right? 
Okay, so you know, Casey Riaz and, fo and team have uh, started build, built the processing software system that really is a, that's a Java that works on a Java applet. Um, and uh, so that technique is about 10 years old. Um, and I've done the glitch, uh, uh, the glitched images that I've been doing from photographs of um, the Arab uprisings are all done in pro processing. But I'm really bored with all of this, and so I'm trying to find something new. And I'm moving into two, what, two directions. One is, it's really mixed reality. It's not augmented. I don't want to have to put a headset on. So I'm really testing out Unreal. I'm testing out Houdini um, and trying to figure out how to actually embody these, this uh, archive of social media. But at the same time, I'm very concerned about the body. So I've got this way um, I want users to be able to walk through it and ha actually literally using a connect, have their bodies um, participate in this data visualization. So I'm going to show you these two video, short videos of uh, where I am um, and how I want it, and then open it up for ideas about glitching the systems. The mushrooms are represent something. The deer represent something. So it's like there is a legend to go with it. Um, I'm not. This was a prototype. I'm, I mean, this is not definitely not where I want to end. It partly I do this because oops no, because um, I want to learn these software because you can't glitch until you've actually understood what it's made up of. You can't interrupt the system until you understand the system. So I want to understand virtual realities and mixed realities. I want to understand it really well so then I can go and think about how I could use it to subvert. I'll just, one more video. This one's just a bit long. Here's just another little idea I, we came up with, but we never finished it. Because you saw the 3D model of VJ Emma that we kind of created. Well, we wanted to set it up with Connect so that you, know, you can stand and it can, you can move it. But you have to do every single bone, and there's a lot of bones, there's a lot of movements. It's really, really hard. So here you can see I'm in there with some grad students. We got the it's a little bit, we got the arm moving. And yeah, it, there's some sound doesn't really mean anything, but 
it was the idea is that you, it's now connected to um, your own Twitter. You can you can actually enter the space now, the archive space, and you can tweet. See, you see, ha ha, and you can actually your tweets are there live. And you can go in there and participate with uh, the idea of really mixing these bodies together. And that is supposed to be Tahrir Square, huh? Um, which, by the way. It's a circle, it's not a square, which is another conversation altogether. But we had used Google Earth to sort of map out what Dakia Square looks like so that we can, we're trying to recreate it so that we can go back in it again. Um, I think I just go on and on. I'm very excited about this. Um, and here is a different way of mapping out those same tweets and territories. Yeah, I think. Thank you.